means go right all right hey everybody this is jeff and this is jeff talks rpgs today the show topic is creating high level adventures and i've brought some high level adventure creators on the show to talk about it uh let me start off tony can you introduce yourself for me sure i just said i was bad at this by the way so you're wait great at this <laughs> uh my name is tony winslow brill and um, I have done lots of different things for lots of different people, depending. Uh, I am a um, admin for AL Adventures League. 
I am the um, one of the resource managers. New new position. What is it, a month ago? Whole month? <laughs> two months. I think it's two actually. I lied. Two whole months. Uh, I worked on Candlekeep Adventures. I mm -hmm. did the end adventure in that book, and I have written uh, many other adventures. And well, we'll specifically say high level adventures for Adventures League and other things here and there. So you can find me. See, this is also I always forget. I just bad at it. Uh, you can find me on social media. Social media. See, now I can't even talk. So that can I leave? I would just no. You're doing good. <laughs> at Vorgrith, uh, V O R G R Y T H. Thank you very much, Tony. And we have Anthony Joyce Rivera. Anthony, tell us about yourself, would you? Hey, Jeff. Uh, thanks for having me on. I'm excited to be here, with Tony and Greg and everybody in the chat. Um, so I'm Anthony Joyce Rivera. You can find me online, mainly on Twitter at Thrawn589, big Star Wars uh, fan. And also my website, anthonydreams.com, uh, where you'll find all my adventures in game design. So I'm mainly an adventure designer. I've done stuff for the Adventures League, for MCDM, for Ghostfire Gaming, and for a bunch of stuff on DMs Guild. So check me out. And I love talking about adventure design and creation, and I'm, I'm ready to go. So let's do awesome. it. Awesome. Thank you, Anthony. And Greg Marks, how about you? Hi, yeah, I'm Greg Marks. Uh, I'm currently also one of the D&D Adventures League admins. I'm one of the content managers. So that means uh, particularly story and adventure design. Uh, I've been working on adventures since uh, playtesting first edition Unearthed Arcana would be my first uh, product that I had a hand in. Uh, I am... Uh, have a lot of particularly high level design work worked for well, you Jeff uh, yes. uh, Fantasy Flight Cobalt Press Watsy uh, Ghostfire I wrote uh, the upcoming uh, Monsters Grimoire the Layers book I wrote a, a third of that a uh, bunch of bunch of stuff having to do with adventure design so I have a lot of experience with high level play excellent that's uh, why I invited oh, you all on the show oh and and then because of I can't forget this uh, social media you can find me at Garrett the Green only the the is spelled 7H3. Sorry. Sorry about that. No, I'm the same way with, with my Twitter. It's J Corbin Stevens, you know, J C O R V I N S T E V E N S. The worst maybe handle in all of Twitter, but you know, <laughs> it's before I, I thought about, you know, being serious about publishing and having my own little company. And we learn, you know, that's what that's how it goes. But enough about that. We're here to talk about creating high level adventures. And so let's first, I want to, there's two ways to discuss this topic. There's the, the way to discuss the topic as being the DM and the DM creating an adventure for their table, who where they know the characters, their levels, what the magic items they have, and, you know, if they're a group of all wizards or whatnot, and they can kind of create that for their, their own table. Whereas the other side of this is writing high level adventures and not knowing what the table is going to have um so i want to kind of cover both topics on that but first let's start with the tropes all right give me a so a low level trope is the simple tropes right the uh go rescue somebody save the town blah blah, blah. what are the tropes of a high level adventure greg let's start with you uh something that potentially changes the planes uh interacting with a deity uh Something that isn't just affecting a nation, but, you know, affecting an entire planet, you know, potentially the end of reality, the apocalypse, those kind of things. I've never written that. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll second uh, Greg's comments there. Uh, one of the tier four ones I wrote is a convergence of gods. So, I mean, like you're always dealing with gods at that level. You yourself as a tier four, you know, if you go from tier three to tier four, huge power level jump um and at like level 20 you yourself are almost like a demigod like a, the equivalent of a hercules or someone like that uh, or if not stronger so uh, definitely like your stereo like it, you know the end of every um multiple trilogy movie or book series like that is what you're dealing with at tier four is like the big cataclysm the big bad evil guy and then you retire hopefully after that if you live yeah. right <laughs> it's a lot more earth like earth shatter, you know, world shattering kind of events because you have to up the stakes. Although sometimes people do like the, to mix in the, go save the kitten from the tree, you know, because if you're, if you're as a player, it can get kind of wearing if that's all, everything is an emergency. The world is dying now. Right. You know? Yeah. So, and I can see that too, as a designer, wanting to kind of make, 
make changes, you know, and not necessarily stick with the high level tropes all the time and just have fun with it. Um, but th that brings up a really good point that the difference between low level tropes and high level tropes. I mean, you, you have to have that high level character in order to do, to, to win that kind of scenario. Um, and so with that, what kind of challenges are involved with that type of design? Uh, let's start with Tony on this one. So when you're designing or when, so let's say you're at a table, all right, let's start with the table side of this. When you're, when you're designing an, an adventure for your table as your DM and you know your characters, what do you think about when you're, do, when you're doing that? So I'm the DM mm -hmm. and it's not for a, like a, if I know the characters, I specifically work to tie in their backstories and things, even if it was like far, far ago, even if it's something really minor, I, players dig that stuff so much. And I do too, as a player, and it, it can be a lot of fun and it can make them more invested because sometimes, mm -hmm. you know, you're like, oh, we're going to save the world and destroy this God or whatever is going on. And there can be a disconnect on, you know, how involved because it gets to be a little rote because you're so powerful after a while. So, you know, if you can pull in those pieces, parts of them specifically into that, then it's, it, it works out a lot better for um, everybody. And it's more fun for yeah. like me as a DM, I guess, too. And like also, if, if, if you're starting, you know, I'm sorry, to, if you're starting from first level and you're getting to know those players and the characters mm -hmm. and the backstories and all that, you can, throughout that story, you can start tying in different things, you know. And, um, Absolutely. Yeah, I think it's probably easier to design for your table than it is a, a published adventure. So much. Yeah, <laughs> so I could definitely see easier. that. Because you never know what if you have a table, you know what's coming, you know what's there, you know, even if, you know, you know what is going to happen and you know those characters to some extent, but, you know, if you're doing a published adventure, it could be a table full of paladins, it could be, you mm -hmm. know, it, it's such a random mix and people's play styles are so different, it is, it's a very different beast. Mm -hmm. Greg, what kind of um, challenges do you think there are for designing a written adventure? Uh, well, so that that's sort of the issue that that Tony just said. So in a in a adventure you designed for your for your friends, you're gonna throw in things to make them care, right? You're gonna throw in this NPC is in trouble and they can't save themselves, that sort of thing. Um, for an adventure for anyone, it's a little harder. Uh, the biggest challenge is you kind of combine those two challenges. You combine, I don't know what you're going to be able to do. You combine that with, uh, so I don't know your abilities with uh, making you care. So that's why a lot of the published adventures have those big earth shattering hooks. Like the world is going to be destroyed. Well, everyone's going to care. I can make sure that regardless of, of who you are, you're going to pay attention. Right. Uh, the, the extra challenge you get in designing an adventure for tier four, where you don't know the players is of course, you don't know their mix or their abilities. So I find in that case, you're probably going to want to lean towards flexibility. So when you do your design, provide more than one way to solve a particular problem, uh, provide uh, options for the DM. So one of the ways you can do that best is, for example, like a sidebar that says your goal is X with this encounter. You want to make this, this part shine and make it happen however it works best with the table you have that sort of thing is a, is a good option. Yeah, that makes sense too. So we've got a couple questions that I think Anthony's going to try and help answer. The first one is the standard of a regular event appears to be something around a four hour block. Is it possible to write an engaging, meaningful tier four module that is only four hours long? And the other question is, do you think at this level players sometimes miss opportunities because there is so much on their sheet? Just curious. The highest I'll, Let's see. The highest I'd played was 15, and I had to type it all out on a Word doc because there was no fitting any of that on a player sheet. So there's so much on your character, basically, you're going to miss things. Yeah, which is where D&D uh, &D Beyond is helpful. But still, I would miss things because there's so many sheets and things to look at and actions and you know, just playing my own character. I think, oh, I should have done this, you know. But so go ahead, Anthony. Can you type yeah. those? 
Yeah. Uh, and Wisconsin for your question. So I wrote a four hour tier four adventure, a convergence of God available for five night. No, I'm, it's on DM skill, <laughs> but anyway, but anyway, uh, do I think you can do a meaningful one? It, I think uh, for a published adventure, I think uh, depends what you define as meaningful, right? So again, a story like Star Wars or Lord of the Rings, those are so evocative and your, your homebrew D, D&D campaign, they're going to be amazing. But a published adventure is more, I would say, in a four hour at tier four, the reality is it may come off like that really cool uh, B movie action flick that's like really fun to watch every once in a while when you need something to watch and you have a lot of fun and you laugh. But, you know, it's not going to have the same like narrative, maybe impact as a full length campaign that your DM curates for you. So I would go in there with that expectation. Like, look, if I'm a DM and I need a, a break or I'm bringing some friends or I'm playing at a convention, you're going to go and go into my set. You're going to have a great time. It's not going to be, you know, the Lord of the Rings adventure or anything like that, but you can definitely do that in four hours. Have a, have a fun time. Um, and yeah, characters, I mean, at that level, their, their abilities are so much. And I think this will go into some of the things we end up talking about is uh, how do you kind of make sure that players have their full potential uh, when they're playing the game? And then the design question is, do you want the characters to have their full potential? Uh, and I'll just, you know, leave that floating question there. I'll, I'll leave my answer is yes, uh, but we'll see where the conversation goes. So that's where I'm at, Jeff. Yeah, so let's talk about that full potential where a lot of times we'll come across uh, characters that, you know, can fly or they could maybe they can all fly or they're so potent in magic that it they could just warp your final enemy where we've got things like legendary resistance to, to um, kind of change some of that up a little bit and some other things within monster creation. But what about, there's often times where you, you know, the easy out is let's hinder the players or their characters, you know, let's, let's put an anti-magic shield or a spell in here and um, no, no spell casting. It's all uh, melee combat or stuff like that. How do you avoid things like that? Let's start with you, Anthony. Yeah, so I thought a lot of I've thought a lot about this question, um, and I I want to preface it by saying uh, my take on it is not to disparage uh, any designers that think otherwise, because I will admit that purposeful design to potentially I would use the word nerf a player's ability can actually create a very cinematic encounter mm -hmm. that's thematic also. Sure. Um, why I come down on the answer of no is this: we've all designed high tier adventures, right? We have never communicated with each other while we design those. At least I haven't communicated with you. And there, there's no been, there's not been like cross collaboration. Okay. So if we think about this as like a, a video game in a sense, you have multiple designers designing multiple adventures or levels where we could potentially all be nerfing the same thing over and over and over and over. And because there's no like uh overarching, you know, overlord who makes sure that we don't nerf, you know, magic in every tier four, or tier three adventure. You can get, uh, for the for the DM who buys the adventure, you don't know the mechanics of a combat encounter until you make that purchase. You'll know like the theme of it by reading the blurb, but you're not going to know the mechanics of the encounter. And if designers go in there and nerf things like wish all the time or flying or magic, you're going to get, a, you could potentially get a lot of DMs, you know, uh, maybe a little bit uh, upset with their purchases where the players are now going to be always nerfed in every encounter, not on purpose, but simply because the designers in trying to make these thematic challenging encounters simply nerf the most powerful things, right? Cause you're going to nerf the, the, the mo more powerful uh, character ability. So that's kind of yeah. where I come down and say me personally, as a designer, what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to not nerf anything. So that way, you know, you could buy my adventure and uh, you know, there's it's open field where everything mm -hmm. goes. So I can definitely see where there's room to nerf in a high level adventure to make it more, role play or puzzly or something like that you know uh give them a, a different out than just casting or combat um so yeah but you bring up a good point to kind of mix it up or if, if it's done in every adventure somebody wants something different so that's your take on how you're going to design that's great you know other people i think i've thrown in a non-magic zone sometimes here or there in some of my adventures but that's just to you know add theme to the adventure it, i think it should make sense if it's in there so Tony, what do you think? No, I agree. And, and there is a difference <coughs> between, again, doing this sort of thing as a, like a published DM skill book, whatever, versus where you have people you don't know 
and other people are writing things that you don't know what they're writing versus your own campaign at home. You don't want to take away those abilities, not only as the DM, but the players get frustrated. Mm -hmm. Players get frustrated and they tune out and they get aggravated. And then they are, again, they disengage because, you know, oh, you know, and once in a while it's fine, but if it's all the time, it's like, oh God, you never let me do this thing. And, you know, then they get frustrated and, and people aren't as likely to have a good time and they want to leave. And so it's a fine line because like you said, sometimes it's cinematic, sometimes it's what works the best and it's what times that you do that mm-hmm. and what times you don't. Mm-hmm. Greg, you got anything to add to that? Um, I would suggest uh, giving them additional things to do. So one of the things that you can use to balance out the fact that the characters have more toys is to give them more challenges simultaneously. So in addition to the, I mean, you can do the standard waves, right? I throw some waves at you, but uh, you can also like, here are innocents taking damage at the same time. Like if you don't, somebody doesn't go over there and rescue them, then they're going to die. So now you've taken a character sort of out of the fight, but they're still doing something meaningful. They're adding to the story, but they're not throwing their huge abilities at the big bad guy at that particular round you can add environmental effects at the same time that someone has to counter you can add uh mike schley has a a, had a really good tip of you know add the the banishment magnet right throw in the the minion who just does so much damage but clearly has no charisma that like okay you're gonna suck up that big banishment spell Mm -hmm. you know the put in the things that are obviously meant to use the big abilities so if you're designing for your home game, that's easy. You know what their big abilities are. You can throw that in there. If you're designing otherwise, uh, you can sort of make some assumptions of things that are common, but again, you can put in that flexibility, right? You can, you can design things saying, here is some choices that you could add to this fight if. So we've done that a few times in some of our high level play. You have a, a big spellcaster that casts banishment a lot, add this extra guy. Uh, you have all melee guys, oh, you know, pull back on some of the range attacks. Uh, you have a lot of PCs at your table, you know, add this extra thing that needs doing. So, so gives everyone something to do that they can't necessarily all focus fire at the same time. And that will balance out the fact that you have these, you know, near demigods at your table. Yeah. And I like the idea to uh, breaking up the team to, show how individually strong each one is uh give them their own little story within that final fight sounds it sounds really interesting what about the use of legendary resistance on on creatures <laughs> you know i i've been in fights before where it's like okay the 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 spellcaster just you know went up the level they've got their high level spell they cast it it's like poof nothing happens it's like ah oh, darn it so it's so, you know, at that point, do you know that, oh, well, I need to cast some other spells to uh, to use up those legendary resistances and save this one and then then hit it? You know, is that kind of the idea behind legendary resistance? I think so. I think you have to do it. I mean, there are too many saver and the game spells. Right. Yeah. And, and I think you can also balance it. Uh, some of the more recent books have introduced mythic uh, mythic on top of legendary actions. And a lot of them have you know, you've defeated the bad guy. Now he assumes his second form. Mm -hmm. So, so when you do have that, uh, I throw this spell at you, we've used up your two or three legendary resistances. You failed your save, you die. Aha. Well, now he becomes this other creature or she has her actual abilities activate. And now you fight a different version of the fight, but still thematically still, you know, you've progressed to another stage. Mm -hmm. Very cool. I like that. Uh, okay, we've got another t- question from Alan Tucker. What do you lean towards for rewards or treasures in a tier four adventure? What do you give the character who has everything already? So, so it's hard. If it's a home game, I would much rather upgrade something they already have mm-hmm. and give it a little more flavor and, you know, kind of because they've already gotten attached to something. You know, that's one thing that I, I, I've always really liked doing and then making it cooler and kind of tying it in and, and doing that thing. It's really hard at high level when you're doing it for a broad group. 
at that point, then for me, I just try to as best, like, you know, oh, this, I don't think this has been out very often, or I don't think this neat thing is, um, and, and it's different versus like Adventures League, where when you write an adventure, you get a list, this is, this is it, right, right, there you go, so you don't come up with that stuff, but when you're writing on your own, you know, there's, and there's so much on the DM skill too, that it, it, you're, you're going to overlap, you just are, yeah, you're just yeah. going to do it, so unless you're making up your own cool, unique item, which is an option and fun to do, um, you just have to expect to be, you know, you're not going to be able to get the adventure who has everything, something. Right. So, and I've, I've heard stories about people who have been running AL tables and they have three people sit down with the same artifact or, you know, magic items that they picked up throughout the, uh, their, their play, which, you know, it's, it's all right. It's cool. Um, but uh, it's yeah it's what that's that shows kind of the limitation of what the treasure is in al but still um gives the characters a, a path to get those yeah there is a there is another option too though uh assuming that you're writing for these these really near demigod characters what about followers? What about land? What about uh, you know starting your own your own town, your own temple, your own fighting school? What about you know all the people that are going to show up because you know you saved their country and now you know they some of them feel indebted to you or they want to give you you know some gift of you know I don't I don't have any you know artifact to give you but you know I breed horses and this this particular was the best horse this year and it's really smart and you know might make a special mount for you. Or uh, the other thing you can do is favors. So, you know, hey, you, you stop this god from destroying this other god. Well, now that god owes you one and they'll, you know, do something. And if you're smart, that something it leads to a different adventure. Mm -hmm. Like, I want to give you this, this favor that, by the way, also comes with all these strings, which is literally the next adventure we're playing. <laughs> uh, you know, I think a good treasure reward for possible, for, um, a possible upcoming Watsy book that that was kind of leaked possibly on Twitter um, would be a nautiloid, <laughs> which would lead them into the next, you know, maybe stage of where Watsy is going. Um, because I don't know, did you all see the gems and how people kind of laced the things together? What, what was it called? The, that could be anything. It could be anything. People are hoping that it's Spelljammer. I've been but, on vacation uh, for like two weeks. I don't know what's going on. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's Every, everything. When, when anybody sees anything like that, it's, oh, Spelljammer's confirmed, you know? Yeah. Um, it's been the April funny. Fool's joke for, I yeah. don't know how many years. Right. Yeah. Right. So here's another question from M. Wisconsin. What are some good rules, loopholes, or tricks that you could exploit as a DM that will still cause a, T, a T4 character to question their sanity. For example, I've found that an air elemental, air elemental pushing a character off the side of a two mile high cliff is effective regardless yeah. of tier. <laughs> That's when you hope you have yeah. feather fall. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I think most, most T4 characters can fly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yes. That's another one. <laughs> or or have the, the ones who don't. <laughs> wings of flying or oh. you know, Cape of the Montebat or you know, whatever they can. There's some tricks. I'll, I'll, I'll be, um, I'll kind of reveal my, some of the tricks I've used in, in, uh, when I was designing my tier four for, uh, adventures league, cause there was a lot of specific, um, there's a lot of design rules that you have to follow in adventures league and CR caps and stuff. Um, so these are tricks that, you know, might help you out there if you're going to design the future, but one was, uh, allowing creatures not to die and that get banished to like go to their plane where their God is and then get like healed up. All the way back to full life and then when they come back oh they're more powerful and they're joining the fight again so that's like one way to kind of like duplicate uh multiple enemies when you really only have one and it's just one that kind of went banished got healed up and, and comes back another one is like um reverse gravity can do some damage you know especially if you make the roof <laughs> like the same height that the reverse gravity works so they're just banging back and forth for this falling damage, uh, you know, as they're, as they're fighting on a bridge, for example, or something like that. So uh, using environmental effects to, uh, you know, like having this cliff nearby where they can get pushed off. 
environmental effects at that at that level, I think, are very appropriate. Um, and you can, I think, to Greg's point earlier, like you can add instead of taking away, you can like add a lot of extra things going on that make the environment a little bit more complex. So it it makes the player pause and say, where do I use my action on my turn? Is it to fight this bad person or is it to stop the, the mountain cliff that the bad guy just shot with a lightning bolt from toppling on top of me, you know, or something like that. So just giving them more choice of the environment. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. The environment I think can add a lot to a battle. Um, if that's where the uh, big bad is living, you know, it's going to be a place that's helpful to them, not harmful to them. So everybody else is probably going to be harmful too. What else, what else can you all think of that we would need to discuss about this topic? I mean, there's a lot to, to, to really think about when you really dig into it, but I'm curious as to your thoughts. Um, I think of two right off the bat. Um, the party where everyone uses dark vision. Remember that dark vision just gives you the ability to see as if it were dim light, so you have disadvantage in all your perception checks. Makes it great when you're trying to ambush someone. Uh, another one that I think is... Uh, better truthfully is is who can you trust you have a tendency to associate with all kinds of questionable folks as adventurers and eventually your allies may no longer be your allies i think a, a better tip or trick is is a story change up rather than a rules exploit especially because when you use a rules exploit eventually someone's going to be like ah, i don't think it works that way and you start this table argument uh, yeah. but if your longtime ally has suddenly grown jealous of, you know, your holdings and you keep leaving the plane to go do things, maybe they try and take them. And that's a, a way more interesting story than, you know, magic doesn't work in this room or something like that. So let's talk about uh, final boss design. Um, is it better to have one big boss that's, equal to the CR of or the APL average party level, or is it better to have multiple bosses that are, you know, uh, combined either, you know, there's the whole scaling thing when you have multiple, but so it's, it's better to have more targets than just one, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah. The PCs will beat you on action economy. So you have yeah. to have more. Yeah, yeah. exactly. They'll just yeah. focus fire and your debt guy will be dead and you know, before you can yep. sneeze. There's and explain, abilities to explain lock action out. economy to me, would you? Uh, you can trade. So everybody has a, a, you know, their move, their bonus, their reaction, their regular action, right? And even if you are some sort of big bad with possibly layer and mythic and legendary actions, the PCs just get so many more actions. They can afford to have a character or two who use their actions to deny you your actions. So counter spells, uh, things that take away your ability to move like Sentinel, things that uh, I use my action to give you disadvantage. There's a number of things that do that. Uh, just things where the PCs go so many more times than a single bad guy does, they can afford to trade action for action. And so they will, they will beat you on that action economy. So if you don't have, that's why you need a lot of, a lot of different mm -hmm. things going on, multiple bad guys to suck up attacks, multiple things going on in the environment, things to save, puzzles to solve, you know, mm -hmm. different kinds of cinematic excitement at the same time. And so your multiple bad guys, if do they roll one initiative or do they roll separate initiatives? Up to you. I do separate because otherwise right. they, you're too easy to do the same focus fire and kill a character right away. Right. Exactly. If they're not important, like they're just moops there to kind of distract from whatever's going on. Sometimes I'll roll them as one, but mm -hmm. usually, yeah, separate is the way to go just because uh, it breaks things up too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. One of the things that I've, I've kind of discovered lately is uh, having minions with healing word, um, they're oh, sitting there yeah. healing the big bad. Well, you better take out the minions, otherwise they're just going to keep healing the big bad guy. You know? <laughs> um, little things like that add to a battle. And I know it's really easy when you think of when I started designing uh, just for my home group because I had never DM before until I started playing Five E. You know, I, I set the them up against one creature who was CR equal to their average APL, and it wasn't a fun fight for either of us i mean they just um 
annihilated the, the big bad. He got maybe one or two punches in, and that was it. So from there, that really helped my designing too of trying to create uh, more um, intense battles or things to think about while they're playing, um, bringing in the minions, that kind of thing, or waves of minions or the layer actions or the environment. Yeah, there's, there's, make them count. Mm -hmm. so, something that um, that brings up a good point with uh, kind of ties in tips and tricks and how do you do this final uh, boss fight? And, and the reality is that the, as the DM, ultimately, you know the stats of the of the final big bad boss, right? And those stats can be created on the fly, modified on the fly. And, and it's hard to go into that fight thinking that way. But if you're looking for a narrative like impact, you don't want the fight to end on the first round you know, for obvious reasons. So you can just narratively keep the fight going, you know, add more hit points to the big bad or have something exciting happen to, you know, maybe the big bads, you know, evil God, like blesses them on the battlefield or something like that to just like restore them back to life or health. Mm -hmm. Something cinematic that draws on the combat to be exciting and engaging, but also gives the characters like the fulfillment of I defeated something evil and hard and that was difficult, but also engaging. So, um, Sometimes I know as a DM, there's a lot of stress on us because we have like 10 different things going on at once, but ultimately we can decide when the fight ends and we should do that at like, if a, if somebody does this really awesome crit, maybe that's when the creature dies, even if it may have a little bit more hit points left. Like maybe that's just a cooler moment. No. So don't forget about that. Yeah, I totally agree. And this, um, so I'll, I'll, Alan Tucker has another question. How do you make the combat interesting, but not last the entire four hour session? which, you know, I mean, we, we want to see fun, engaging fights, but Tony, you're laughing. Let's, let's, let's That's see what you're difficult. <laughs> it's fair because there are so many more things that everybody can do when you're high level, not just the DM stuff, but the players The turns take way longer. And it's, and it's just a matter, even if everybody's ready and they're reading and they're like, okay, I'm going to do this thing and they're ready. And then the player before them does something and they totally have to change what they were yep. going to do. And then it takes yep. time. And so, you know, sometimes in cases, like if you need to shorten the fight, maybe the bad guys got a little less hit points. Maybe mm -hmm. it's not as hard. Maybe, you know, it, I mean, there's lots of ways you can drag fights out. There's also ways you can pull them back in and you'll have to judge that time like oh i only got like you know an hour left of this and we can either take a break and come back at it which you know a lot of people do and i do too or you know <laughs> things suddenly change as as you know anthony said you have to change the fight then and you're empowered as the dm to do that regardless of what is in front of you and so it's another way you have to kind of balance now is that an al play also you're allowed to make changes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. I uh, another idea that you might consider. Um, I think we can all agree that the CR math is not optimal at, at high levels, particularly because there's so very much variation in the way a DM mm -hmm. runs things. Um, in general, hit harder, hit more often, uh, but necessarily don't don't necessarily increase hit points as much or increase a little bit. Uh, but if you're if you're short on time, make the bad guy scary, but don't necessarily make them, you know, unhittable, for example, or right. the other option. Uh, there's a couple of good fights this way. Uh, you know, a bunch of cultists, small, small plebe cultists summon this big giant monster that is, you know, takes like virtually no damage, but you can kill the cultists in one attack. And if once you kill all seven of them, now the monster takes damage and it doesn't actually have that many hit points. It just hits like a truck. That's so cool. something like that where you can, you know, I just got to run over here, get this guy. You run over there, get that guy. And once we have them all down, then we can focus fire on the real monster. Mm -hmm. And when you're designing it for publication, a lot of this stuff can be put in sidebars, you know, as mm -hmm. far as tips and tricks for changing the adventure or, um, you know, making it more difficult or less difficult because not every table wants to play a, a massive battle you know more, some ta some tables are more interested in role play and um other types of aspects of the game uh, so but other other tables really want to fight and use their abilities and use that character that they've built up you know for 20 levels so when you design it's a great thing to put suggested um scaling suggestions on as a sidebar uh to make it 
customizable, you could say. And then and, and as a DM, you don't have to, well, uh, speaking outside of AL, you don't have to follow those suggestions. You can do whatever you want with it. Publish adventure. I mean, you can change the big bad all if you want to. You can um, do that in AL too. Can you? Yeah. See, I don't know all the rules of AL <laughs> as far as that goes. So, um, but what's been, let's talk about AL adventures then real quick, since that's what you guys have published for high level. What's your favorite high level AL adventure? Either that you've written or that you've played or seen. Let's start with Greg. Oh. Uh, <laughs> uh, does it have to be you want you want AL specifically? Yeah, let's go with that. Um biggest problem is I've written a good chunk of them. <laughs> yeah, um, if it's not mine, Greg, I'm gonna be so mad. I'm gonna be so mad. <laughs> uh, um, <laughs> trying to think that's, of, uh, yeah, that's there are lots, yeah. Uh what is the best one? I'm not sure. I mean, there's, to, to be fair, I think what makes the good adventure is the good DM alongside with players that you have fun with. Mm-hmm. And I can do that with, with almost any adventure. Um, so there's a, there's a lot of high level ones that I think are, are very entertaining. Um, I'll, I'll just choose one of mine because I can think of it. Uh, the season four finale uh, that ended at the very beginning of tier three, but it's Ravenloft. So, uh, you know, generally a lower, lower level, but I wrote it like a, you know, a standard of monster hunting type one, where if you, if you didn't bring in all the information, if you didn't do all the things to like link all the clues, the fight is darn near impossible. She's the end boss is definitely way tougher than Strahd. Okay. Uh, what about, what about your favorite non ale adventure? Um, my favorite non ale adventure finale, uh, or big one, uh, the end of living Arcanus, the, or at least the original living Arcanus arc that started out as a, as a rough, a rough go for us. And then our, uh, our friend, Sean Molly ran the second round of it and turned it into, uh, just an amazing, amazing experience. Yeah, we were gonna all murder each other, actually. Yeah. <laughs> or we yeah. were there was a contingency in place because one of the characters uh was about to switch sides. <laughs> yeah. And that was really fun. Like, you know, everybody's like, oh my god, no. Mm. So yeah, that by the way, the, the worst, that. yeah, your worst villain villains are each other. Yeah. Probably the, the highest level I've played is we finished the Horde of the Dragon Queen, Rise of Tiamat. Um and that final battle where they're summoning Tiamat and you've got the cultists and they're up in the air and they've each got like legendary re- or legendary resistance, I believe, that you've got to try and knock them down. That was probably the toughest battle um, that we that I've been in because there's so much going on and you've got to take these guys down before they summon her. And, um, that was a really interesting design. Uh, I think for me, so I'll say I have... I have only I have run level 20 like campaigns to level 20. I have designed you know tier four, but I have only played as a level 20 character one time. And that was actually this past week uh, on the uh, D3 D D cruise I was on, and my DM was Critical Bard. And we started playing, it was it was four sessions. These are four four-hour sessions. So this goes back to that question about the four-hour session. Can you have a meaningful tier four? Um we were level six when we started. We did two sessions. We leveled up to level seven for our third. And then at the end of our third, he says, you're going to level up to level 20. And the final session was fighting the big bad gods. Like we were the chosen demigods of ours and we were fighting the bad god. And we had a four hour session of level 20 characters. And it was extremely, mean. It was it was one of the best uh, sessions of d and I've ever played. So shout out to Critical Bard. For DMing that, and it was his homebrew uh, adventure. And at the end, we killed the evil god, and we became going back to the rewards. We became gods of that realm, representing the gods we just killed. And we were told at the end, he just said, "What do you do as a god in that world?" And that was our reward. Like that was an, an untangible thing, um, but it was so meaningful. And like I'll remember my character and that experience forever. So you can do it in four hours, and you don't have to have a published epic tier four to do this like you can at home mm-hmm. 
be a DM and run your own thing and be just as awesome. Now for, if you're looking for a published one, I will say I haven't, I've read it several times, but it's Alan Patrick's, uh, those that came before it's a very popular AL, uh, you know, started off as a DDAO and it has like this uh, crazy custom paladin dragon that'll smite the hell out of you. So watch out. But, um, that one I've heard a lot of good stuff about. So I've heard that one too. I haven't read it yet though, but I think I might have it. I've heard about it. Tony. It's a pretty good one. Um, there's so many, like I, I, what Greg was talking about earlier for like playing, that was, that was it. That was, that was amazing. There were gods flying around and, you know, tables were doing stuff and it was great. It was <laughs> chaos, but it was great. <laughs> um, for Adventures League, I mean, there's, there's a lot and there's, there's really good ones. And I, I don't, I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings. No, 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 no. Awesome. that's cool. That's fine. I understand. I understand. <laughs> but I, I wrote understand. one and I wrote moment of peace and I like that one a lot. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. It's funny that we, we all, well, I don't know. Sometimes I like what I write. Sometimes I don't, but there's other people sometimes like it. Sometimes they don't. So it's, you know, it's, you're, it's hard to tell who you're writing for, who's going to be playing it, who's going to be, who's going to be reading it. Um, but that's one of the things, like if you're a designer, picking up some of these that you've mentioned are good to read because they kind of give you ideas of how somebody did something, you know, to make this interesting uh, or memorable. Um, and so a- as a designer, I think it's it, it, it's really on you to do your research, you know, and not just think that, OK, I can pick up a I can write a tier four adventure, no problem at all. You know, I'm not going to have any problems. I'm going to put the big bad here. And this is what we're going to do. But then, you know, if you don't re- if you don't reference these other materials and say, oh, well, I didn't think of this or, or I didn't think about scaling suggestions or I didn't think about having multiple monsters. And, you know, you're, you're really not. You haven't done the research to know how to do it correctly, I don't think. I forget who said it first, but uh, consume voraciously and steal shamelessly. Uh, it was probably your best uh, best choices, especially if it's for your home game. Uh, your ideas can come from anywhere mm-hmm. and in fact, likely do. I mean, uh, Under Mountain the Musical, right? Like I wrote, that was a, an any award-winning adventure that, I mean, it was based around a bad, funny musical. Like that was the idea, uh, which uh, if, you, if you hadn't done any, research into how theater works that one wouldn't work so well right but then you know also steal good ideas there are it's often said there's also no original ideas anymore right right so come up with a cool idea twist it bend it make it yours you know maybe hybrid it with a different idea and now you've got an interesting story that seems relatively new and unique mm-hmm. for me that yeah. i get hung up on that i'm like <laughs> oh this somebody else did this cool somebody somebody else did this that. is cool somebody I'm else. <laughs> But you make a good point there. As a home DM playing for your home group, the more you consume, the more your ideas you're going to have. And, you know, your group doesn't know where you get these ideas. You know, you can put your own spin on it. You can tie multiple ideas together and create this epic battle or this epic campaign. I know there's a lot of people who picked up my my adventures and said they they ripped pieces out of it and use that. They don't have to run the whole thing. They're just getting ideas out of it. And a lot of people who buy things off the DMs Guild do just that. They don't run the entire adventure they strip pieces out encounters um npcs that kind of thing which is totally cool i mean that's great if you find something that's that's useful to you in my work hey fantastic i'm glad you picked it up and i'm glad you used it for candle keep i got that idea while i was watching a nature show on parasitic wasps Nice. Yeah, I was told I was not allowed to watch nature shows anymore but (laughs) Uh, (laughs) i was like oh (laughs) interesting yeah it's pretty funny where you can get your inspiration too sometimes um yeah i i'll i'll add a little thing here for people you know out there that are looking to design i found in my experience you know um as much as i think DD players and dms alike like love the idea of tier four it is very hard to pull off and Mm -hmm. you just need to know that going in because um there's a lot of reasons why but um, you know, from an adventurous per- perspective specifically, it is to have the impact that you want at such a climactic moment in a kit player character's career. Um, it's just hard to do 
in, in a, in a short time, you know, like 10,000 words or less type of thing. So uh, just take that into consideration. Just know that what you're doing is actually not only harder mechanically than any other tier, but it's narratively probably just as hard, if not a doubly hard uh, to do. So kind of just steal your mind uh, and, and act accordingly. You are uh, designing, I, sorry. No, 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 go ahead. You're not designing a, a tier four ever really to get rich. And I'm sure Anthony can tell you this. Uh, <laughs> I have lots of ability to look at sales numbers for, for wizards, for the DMs guild, et cetera. And as much as there is a vocal audience that says everything should be tier four, we want more tier four. It's a fairly small vocal audience. I think so, that's because low level is a lot more fun to play in my opinion than, than high level. Well, And everyone starts low, right? Like yeah. we, we know most campaigns end between 12 and 14th level. The vast yeah, majority. They peter out before. Yeah. 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 So I mean, I liked I like tier four. I've written a fair amount of T4, but it doesn't uh you're you're not doing it to to make the big bucks. Right. Yeah. Um, but like you know, as I mentioned, low level is a lot of fun. I would rather I, I think there's challenges in both sides. It's just the reverse. You know, in, in tier four, you have to think of what the characters can't do. What can't they do that is going to be a challenge to them? Whereas in level one, tier, you know, tier one, it's like the characters can't do much. What can they do that is not that is going to make them feel good, you know? Um, and yeah, so it's kind of it's like that reverse gravity type thing. Um, and so when you're designing tier four, it's like, okay, well, passive perception 14, forget it. You know, they're gonna notice that. It's, you gotta think about these things that that they're gonna be easily. Uh, that they're going to easily ca- uh, tackle and and um, uh, finish if they encounter it. Uh, so yeah, there's a lot of there's a lot to really consider when you're designing tier four. Um, but as a as a DM who's started their campaign and gone from first level on up to level twenty as a home game, you know what their limitations are. You know those characters and their backgrounds, and so I think it's a little bit easier for that DM to generate. Uh, um, a good t uh, a good high level adventure or end of their story um, because they do know their characters and they know the story and the plot and they know what the characters they have a feeling of what the characters want to get out at the end you know what that reward's going to be it's hard to write high level it, it just is it, it's and in my opinion it's harder than writing low level and not everybody can do it and that's okay i mean that's because there's so much you have to plan and like you said people some people don't like it and it's a very different beast you know low level versus high level and it's almost a different game i mean it's not but it is it's just a different feel and you know yeah i think you know you're to become more technical mm -hmm. yeah but the the idea behind tier four is to still challenge the characters um, but I think it's more of an epic challenge. Like, you know, we were talking about breaking them up, breaking up the team and having them fighting uh, one versus many to save um, some innocence or something or, or take down another piece of the puzzle and have a couple battling the big bad. And, you know, that's uh, that, that's a cool ending, I think. And that's how we were in, when we were, uh, you know, Horde of the Dragon Queen, Rise of Tiamat didn't go up to tier four. I think it, we were... 15th level so we were just at the beginning um but it was still a pretty epic battle i think at the end and my brother actually ran us through um a mock battle with tiamat and we got roasted uh could be because we didn't develop our characters correctly throughout the adventure um <laughs> but yeah it, she tore us up um you know one thing for uh would be you know adventure designers and, and would be dms who want to like give this ti level play a, a, a kind of go uh, I've thought a lot about this. I've pondered it, but it's the concept of like a mini campaign in the sense of, you know, you do like four adventures and each adventure is done at a certain tier and you just like bump the characters up and you narratively can explain that in between. But, you know, that's a way for, you know, newer DMs who, who don't have like two years to dedicate to a campaign from levels one to 20. All right. I mean, I got three kids, so tell me, I don't got that time anymore, but, but, uh, <laughs> you know, you can kind of like leapfrog there and get the flavor and the experience to kind of wrap things up. And then also from, I have 
I, I, you know, I'm, I don't have plans to do this uh, just because of time constraints, but one of a, a project I thought would be neat would be like a four uh, adventure arc that does take you from one to 20 doing that tiered approach. Uh, I think that could sell uh, decent, you know, if it's packaged right. And uh, it's, it's kind of, you know, fit that way. You get a little mini experience of uh, mini campaign to level 20 real quick. I think JVC Perry put one out. It wasn't Call from the Deep. Wasn't that a one through twenty? That's right. So, he did. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm not sure how many sessions. Well. I'm 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 saying more like it would take four sessions to play right. through or, or okay. five versus four four um, hour sessions. <laughs> Perhaps yes, <laughs> it can be done. I mean, you know, I, I think with when my group gets together on weekends, um, it may be a four hour session or a six hour session that we have scheduled, but we probably only get two hours of gameplay in because we're BSing with each other the entire time or <laughs> cracking jokes or whatnot. Um, yeah. Still a great time though. I mean, so great. Another thing you oh. can do if you're interested in getting that level 20 play in, uh, and I've seen it done a few times, uh, start your campaign with uh 20th level characters that die so run that first adventure that they're the great heroes protectors of the world whatever it is have that that first one session adventure and make sure they all die at the end and then now you make your real characters and you're in this world where you know the the great heroes actually lost and now you know the next generation has to take over and you know solve this problem because they were so cocky their 20th level they went in they died you need to be smart about it and role play and you know solve the mystery or whatever in a <laughs> in a better way yeah chili draws just puts um i'd love to see a time travel adventure where you start out at level 20 and have to <laughs> quantum leap back to level one so that would be dope yeah, so basically that's a good I, idea there you go I like that yeah. that's cool. the thing that you can do at high level is put in that moral quandary is yeah. really defeating this big bad guy the like you know yeah but maybe the outcome what that when you save everyone is worse than when you started you know you mix it up and, and make them think about it maybe they don't want to do this you know but then what then what do they do and they have to delay and you know and it can really kind of change things up definitely yeah, there's all kinds of great ideas that people can come up with or you know take off of other products and um, that that in itself is a great idea. And so is the quantum leap backwards or the, the dying at level 20 and then then they create their real character. But I think we've gotten a lot out of this show um, and discussing high level design and play and getting ideas for people for DMs and, and designers. Uh, so I want to thank you all uh, for be, being on the show. We're almost out of time. So I do want to give you some time to re shout out. And also I for being guests on the show, I do donate to charity for each of the guests. Um, uh, Tony, can you tell me who I donated to you or for you to? How, how do I say that? <laughs> I I sent them I sent them twenty dollars for you. Who man? Who was that? Magic. <laughs> you sent it to the uh, Moya Moya Foundation, mm -hmm. uh, and that is a foundation that uh, helps. This is a disease that generally strikes children. Uh, it is a blood vessel disease in the brain, and um, my niece has been stricken with that, so I really appreciate that uh, you donated for that. Certainly. And then, Greg, I sent uh, $20 to Extra Life for you. Yep. Uh, yeah, I, I went with the standard uh, wizards. We're, we're on Team Extra Life. That's our, our main choice. It's a great, so, it's a great choice, choice, too. And then, Anthony, can you tell us about yours? Yeah, so um, I am potentially working on something right now. It is in the works. Hopefully it comes to fruition. It'll be a quick turnaround. But uh, even if that doesn't, it's going to the same place it would be. And that is uh, to Ukrainian refugees. Uh, going to get that uh, donation out to them uh, who are in great need right now. So yeah. thank you, Jeff, for doing that. Certainly. No, I appreciate you all being on the show. And um, I enjoy donating to help people out. So uh, thank you for picking the charities. Uh, and so let's go through one more time. Greg, let's start with you. Where can people find you and, and what can they pick up that's going to help um, found or uh, fund your ongoing career? <laughs> uh, I have lots of stuff on, on the DMs Guild. That's probably the easiest. Uh, if you're looking for a published project, uh, Monster Grimoire and Monster Grimoire Layers from Ghostfire should be coming out uh, any day now. I know the PDFs went out to Kickstarter backers not that long ago. Uh, 
but otherwise yeah go to the dms guild tons of stuff plenty of it's uh, tier four so you can find all kinds of uh, <laughs> options there uh if you're looking to find me uh you can always email uh content at dnd dn the adventurers league.org uh, or you can follow me on Twitter at scare at the green S K E R R I T seven H three green. <laughs> Thank you, Greg. Thanks again for being on the show. Sure. Anthony, how about you? Let's, let's hear from you again. Yeah. So you can find me again. I'm mainly on Twitter at Thrawn five, eight, nine, uh, talking D and D and all kinds of stuff on there. And I'm easily accessible. Um, my website is Anthony dreams.com where you'll find links to all of my, uh, game design. So, you know, I got some Arcadia stuff, DM skill stuff, Adventures League and stuff from Ghostfire and, and a lot of other cool stuff. So uh, that's where you'll find like the hub for everything. And again, Jeff, uh, great show. I love, you know, these chats. So thanks for having us on. I, I really appreciate it. It's awesome. Thank you. Thank you for saying yes. Tony Winslow Bro, where can we find you and what can we help? What can we? <laughs> I can't. It's contagious. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. How can people support you? Uh, you can find me on, um, Twitter and discord and, um, Instagram at Vorgrith, V-O-R-G-R-Y-T-H. Uh, you can find some adventures that I've written on the DMs Guild. Currently, I, like I said earlier, I've taken a new position as an AL admin, um, with author recruitment and project management. So, you know, there'll be that sort of a thing. So, uh, and I have a couple projects that I can't talk about. <laughs> so there's that. Well, or you could again, find Candle Keeper, just tell me how cool it is. There you go. Candle Keep Mysteries, the last adventure is Tony's. Yes. And what level is that one? Uh, 16. There you go. Yeah, because they brought it, it down. It changed. Yeah, they brought it down. It was originally 20. The original version I turned in was 20, and then they brought it down. And I forgot to do this in the middle of the show, but Jenny Loveday is the host and uh, we're, she's running this on her Twitch channel. If you would give her a like, subscribe or whatever you can to Jenny hey. Loveday's Twitch channel, we would appreciate it. And I am Jeff Stevens. I'm the host. This is my show, Jeff Talks RPGs. It's been a pleasure having you all on. It's been a pleasure having the uh, questions from the, the uh, Twitch listeners, watchers, or whoever you are. I hope you enjoyed the show. And until next time, may all your roles be crits or natural ones, whichever one is better for you. <laughs> <laughs> Bye. Bye. Yeah. <laughs>